Hey guys, Shelby Mathis here, and you're in for a treat today because we're going to go over the five top investments that reduce your taxes. And it's not just reduction of taxes. It could also be creating tax-free income, tax-preferred types of income, even having tax-free growth. And so we're going to dive on in and go over them. What I'm going to do is go over really three areas that uh, we're going to talk about here that involve tax savings. The number one is going to be that you get a, oops, you go to black. Is that you? Uh, is, is that the investment reduces your current taxes? So if you get a checkbox here, it's going to reduce your current taxes that you owe right now. So there's going to be a column. I'm just going to make. I'll just do it like this. One, two, three. You'll be able to see that. And the Number one column is going to be that it reduces your current tax. You'll see, I'm going to make a little chart up here and we're going to be able to go through them and see what, which areas of tax benefit they're going to give you. So number one reduces your current taxes. How about number two, which is you pay no tax on the income generated. In other words, the money that it's kicking off is either going to be tax preferred or tax free. So I'm going to go over each type of my top five, and we're going to see which ones actually create income that are that's tax free income. That is highly sought after, by the way. And then the last column is going to be, you guessed it, tax free growth. All right. So do they grow? tax-free? Can we compound inside these vehicles or by investing in these vehicles and end up with a whole bunch of money at the end of the day without having to pay tax as we go? Because your compounding is much, much more efficient when you're not having a tax bleed off. It's not taking it away. So let's jump in. I'm going to go over number one and I'm just going to make little columns here. So you'll see one, two, look, I can't draw a straight line, three, four and i guess whatever let's make a big old chart this will be fun boy this one stinks let me get uh, make a straight line there it goes all right so number one what's number one my favorite is real estate and there's a number of reasons why can real estate actually reduce your taxes when you buy it the i'm just going to put a little green check mark here because the answer is yes how does it do it Number one, you could be investing in short-term rentals. If it's seven days or less average use, the losses on that aren't considered passive. They're not rental losses that create passive losses. They could be ordinary loss. There's a step you have to take called material participation. But if you're running your Airbnb, VRBO, whatever, you're going to qualify more than likely. There's seven ways to qualify. That property the depreciation off of that property. If you don't know what depreciation is, I have a bunch of videos on real estate tax, but it's basically the structure itself gets written off as a deduction over its useful life. And you can accelerate that and write off a whole bunch of it in year one if you want. But that short-term rental paper loss can offset your other income. Number two is you could be an active participant in your rental properties. So if you're active, you get a $25,000 loss allocation. You can get up to $25,000. Now there's a phase out. If you are over $100,000 of gross income up to 150, you'll only get part of that, but you still can end up with just buying a regular rental property. You might be surprised that you're actually able to offset some of your income, especially you guys, if you're in the 80, $90,000 range, or maybe you're here. Here's a good one. You're married filing jointly and you're making over 120,000, you take your standard deduction, you're going to qualify. And all of a sudden you're going to, let's say it's a $10,000 loss that you're able to take on your tax return. It's not, you actually lost money. You bought a property, the depreciation created a paper loss and it's putting money back in your pockets. This is as though you made $10,000 less than what you actually made. So we actually like that. So those are two. And then there's real estate professional if you ever meet somebody who says, I make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and I pay zero tax, chances are they're a real estate investor. Chances are they're a real estate professional. They qualify under 469C7 as a real estate professional. It's a topic for another day. 
but we unlock those losses and we can offset, um, you know, literally a an insane amount of our income just by buying more real estate. In fact, the old joke in the accounting world is if you're paying taxes, it's because you don't own enough real estate. Number two, does uh, you, can you avoid pay, you know, make that look better, pay no tax on the income generated? Well, yeah, absolutely, because you get that thing called depreciation. The depreciation is going to make it so that your income here, I'll give it a big old check mark. That depreciation is going to offset the income that it's making. So if you're making rents, for example, and you're taking a deduction for the value of the building, you're literally writing that off sometimes over 27 and a half years, sometimes over 39. If you're smart and you listen to this channel, you probably know you can do five, seven and 15 years and accelerate it all into year one if you really want to with accelerated depreciation and 168K taking bonus depreciation, we can get a massive amount of deduction and we it didn't cost us money, it's paper. So it's offsetting the income that's being generated. So if you make $20,000 a year in rents and you have $20,000 a year of depreciation, you pay zero tax. Even though you have the 20,000, even though it's in your bank account, you pay no tax. Now, how about tax-free growth? I'm going to give this one a check mark too. That's why we love real estate. That's why it's number one. It's, it's checking off each box because we can do what's called a 1031 exchange and we get a step up in basis when we pass. Let's go through those. I can buy property. Let's say I bought three houses and uh, rental properties all for $200,000. So it's a total of what, 600 grand. Let's say over the years, those properties go up in value. So let's say 10 years later, I'm looking at those properties going, man, I bought them each for 200 grand. Now they're worth 400. All right. And I sell those. I sell them for $1.2 million, but I use a 1031 exchange and I buy another property. Maybe it's an apartment building, duplex, eightplex, whatever it is. And I buy another property at 1.2 and it goes up in value to 3 million and I sell that. And I buy two properties that are uh, commercial properties. Let's say that it goes up and it's worth uh, 3 million bucks, right? And then those ones go up in value to 6 million. And then those ones go up to 10 million. And after 30, 40 years, I'm sitting on this little real estate portfolio that's worth 15 million bucks. When I pass away, the basis steps up to 15 million. My heirs pay zero tax on the sale of those properties. That's why you do step ups. 1031 exchange allows you to continue to exchange those properties forward and buy new properties. Uh, as long as it's the same price or more, you're gonna be able to do that. And yes, it could be multiple properties. You could sell multiple properties and buy one. You can sell one and buy multiple properties. As long as it's real estate, you can do that. And that's why it gets a big old check mark there. How about number two? Number two is oil and gas. Now here's the funny thing with oil and gas. When you buy oil and gas, there's something called intangible drilling cost. And I'm gonna give this a check, whoops. I'm going to make, give it a green check because those intangible dr drilling costs, IDC, are treated as ordinary loss in English. What does that mean? It means if I invest, I just did this. I put a couple hundred thousand dollars last year into a, a, a into a series of wells. I received in exchange, when I, my first year, my first year K-1 was over $150,000 in loss. What does that mean? I, it means I, I invested, but I get this huge amount of loss. Sometimes it's 85%. So I put $100,000 in, let's just use this example, and you get it, let's say it's 80, $80,000 loss. I use that $80,000 to offset other income. It's not passive, it's not capital gain. It is. It can offset my W-2 income, and I get a deduction for whatever that intangible drilling costs. It's usually between uh, 70 and 85% of the value of whatever your investment is, depending on what you're doing. It's 100% deductible and it's absolutely potent when you're investing because it, let's just say I invested $100,000 into something, maybe it's 50,000, I'll we'll use 50. And let's say it's 80%, so it's 40,000. And I'm in the highest bracket, I'm in California. You're getting a big chunk. You're getting 37% plus your state on the deduction on some of those things. Uh, it could be, very, very potent. You always got to check the state and make sure it comports with the federal, but you get this big old loss as an ordinary loss, which means you get money in your pocket because you're not having to pay tax on that from other sources. Like you can wipe out your W-2 income. How about paying tax on the income? Now you do pay tax on the income that it generates, but I'm still going to get out of a check mark 
because you have what's called depletion. So you're only having to pay tax on 85% of the revenue that it produces when you're selling the oil. You are actually getting that money. That's how the oil wells work is you get this big fat deduction and then they're generating oil and they're selling oil and they're paying you out. It usually takes you five to seven years to get 100% of your money back. And then after that, it's gravy. It's literally could be 10, 15 years of extra payments. Um, my experience is you're usually looking at between a seven and a 10% return when it's all said and done. But the big value is when you invest, it's going to give you a huge tax deduction. Uh, tax free growth, I'm not going to give it a check on that. So I'm just going to give that a blank because it's just kicking you out income. It never stops, right? We're not getting out of that oil well, unless you sell the land or something like that. But realistically, when you're just an investor, we're not getting into that. We're not getting into that deep. I'm not going to tell you that it's going to give you a, a huge deduction. Number three, let's get into number three, right? Traditional retirement. And what I'm talking about here is your IRAs your DB plan, which I'll go over, your 401k, your different types of retirement plans. Um, it could be a Roth, it could be uh, a Roth IRA, it could be a Roth 401k, but we have different types of retirement plans. If you're not familiar with the DB plan, I did a video on how to write up or how to put over $100,000 a year into your retirement plan. That's a DB plan. I have plans that my clients are doing that where they're putting $300,000 a year tax deductible 400, 500, have one guy just going over $700,000 a year into a retirement plan. Yes, tax deductible. It's a reverse calculation. It's based off of how much you've been making, how much you expect to make, and how old you are. And a actuary who's licensed with the IRS gets to do the assumptions, gets to make a, a here's what the numbers are, here's how much you could put away. But you could put away an obscene amount of money in a DB plan. And here's the beautiful part. When you're doing a traditional plan, other than Roth, you get a deduction. So with a typical uh, IRA, for example, you might get $7,000 a year, plus you get a, a makeup if you're over 50. Um, if you're trying to do a, a DB, it could be, you know, it could be 50,000. That's where they really start to be worth it to probably about 1 million. I've never seen one get quite that high, but it's in that range where you're getting, you know, they're, they're, I've heard of some that were that big. But you're, if you're older and you've been making a big chunk of money and all of a sudden you realize I'm behind the eight ball as far as my estate plan or my retirement planning is concerned and I need to fund my retirement plan, you could be getting a couple years, few years to get three million bucks in there. You might be able to get up there. Um, if you're doing a 401k, we're looking at $69,000 a year per plan. Like you can have multiple 401k plans. And you could go up to $69,000 in each. So if you have two employers and you're high, high income, maybe you have your, your, your uh, a home business and you're doing stuff on the side with somebody else. Yes, you could actually have two 401ks. If you're in that boat, though, I'm probably looking at DB plans pretty strong. It means you're making a ton of money. But 69000 plus there's uh, makeup provisions. And uh, the only thing is that this is except Roth. So you don't get a deduction when you put money into a Roth. So uh, those ones uh, have other benefits. You don't get the deduction when you put a Roth in, but then you never pay uh, tax on the growth or the income that it generates. So let's do number two. Number two, I'm going to give it a, 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 a check, but I'm going to do like a check minus because the traditional, you don't get the benefit. Traditional plans equals pay tax as it comes out. But with a Roth, you pay no tax when it comes out. And you could have a million, two million, three million. There's actually Peter Thiel has like $4 billion in his Roth. Never going to pay tax on any of its growth. Never going to pay tax on any of the money that comes out. And I just want to plant a seed. If you are a, if you are starting out, like you're a low income taxpayer, like, hey, I'm below the standard deduction. You're, you know, 16, 17, 18, you know, to probably about 24, you might be in this range and you're not paying tax, get a Roth. Because if you put money in there, you never paid tax going in and then you'll never pay tax on any of its growth and you'll never pay any tax when it comes out. So you could literally make millions of dollars in this thing, never 
paying one red cent in tax. So, and if you have kids and you're paying for like, let's say you're paying for their schooling or whatever else, but you can get them involved in your business. Maybe it's a real estate business. Maybe it's a side gig or whatever. Get them on, involved in your business to where you're paying them and funding a Roth. If they're under 18, you don't have to do withholdings and uh, employment taxes. There's ways around just about everything. So if, again, if you, there's, there's all sorts of fun stuff. I think I've done videos on how to employ your kids too, but um, it ends up working. And then all of them get this guy, all get tax-free growth, all growth in retirement plans is tax-free. So you can get in there, you could do crypto, you can do stock, you can be doing covered calls and doing all sorts of fun stuff. You can even be buying real estate in it, in a self-directed IRA or self-directed 401k. Uh, you could be uh, doing all sorts of different investments. And at the end of the day, they all grow tax free inside the plan. The only time you pay tax on a traditional plan is when it comes out. You have to start taking required minimum distributions. If you're in a Roth, you never have to pay. That's why they are so potent. Number four, hope you guys are liking these. If you like these thus far, just give us a little like and maybe share it and subscribe. You know, just do something so that the algorithm says, hey, these guys like it. Um, this would be charities, which is a 501c3 or a donor advised fund. All of these get the same attribute. Uh, and by the way, yeah, you could set up your own charity. <laughs> you can absolutely, like there's all sorts of fun stuff you could do with charities. It could be uh, sports, it could be education, it could be feeding people, it could be a church, it could be um, amateur sports teams. I, I have a sanctioning body here in Las Vegas that for, for, uh, for Muay Thai boxing and stuff like that. Uh, it could be low income housing, it could be transitional housing, it could be assisted living, all those things qualify. And what we like about it is you get a deduction when it comes in. And it could be a massive deduction. If you're doing cash contributions into retirement plan, a public charity, this could be up to 60% of your AGI. So everybody that's got high W-2. So this is to all you guys that are all my doctors out there, right? You guys that are crushing it as a surgeon or something. And you're like, my accountant said I can't do anything. Yes, you can. Set up a charity. You fund it. You push money in there. It's offsetting your tax. You get a tax deduction. But what am I going to do with it? Invest it. Put it in a donor advised fund. I got one. You could do it. They're, 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 they're nothing, right? You just, like, all you got to do is just sit there and manage the money and let it grow, grow, grow. And eventually it's going to go to a 501c3. Hint, it could be your 501c3 if you do it with a group like us. If you go through like a Fidelity or others, it's going to be a list that you could be donating. Maybe it's your, maybe it's your favorite organizations anyway. But you could be putting the money in there, taking a deduction now, growing it inside the donor advised fund or the charity if you have a 501c3, again, it could be investing in things. For those of you guys who think I'm crazy, Ikea is a flipping charity. Harvard is a charity. Major League Baseball is a charity. The Green Bay Packers are a charity. All these things are 501c3s. There's lots of different ways to set them up. But the beautiful part is that those investments compound tax-free. You never pay tax on them if they're in the charity. So, you know, there's great examples. The Hershey uh, Charitable Fund, where they have the Hershey School. That thing's worth like 13 billion dollars now set it up in 1905 i think it was and uh, milton hershey and his wife didn't have kids and uh, this is where they put their money and just keeps compounding it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger so these things are uh, really effective tools so i love the charity side but you get a massive deduction if it's a private foundation where you set it up for like your, your family and just giving away money to other charities you can go up to 30 percent of your adjusted gross income um and again, there's so many different flavors of these. I think we did a video. I did a video with Kareem Hanafi uh, in our offices, who's, who was an IRS uh, attorney uh, for the exempt divisions and did that stuff for years and works works with us. We did, we did I think, our top 10 ideas for charities or top 10 types of charities. Uh, so check that out if, if, that's, if that's tickling your fancy. Uh, pay no tax when the income's generated <clears throat> or... Uh, uh, when it's coming out, pay note uh, on the income that it actually pays you out. You do pay tax here. You pay tax on salary only. So if you take it out as a salary, 
Otherwise, no tax on growth. This is a big one. If the charity keeps the money, so if you set up a foundation and its sole purpose is to grow its income and then distribute it to other charities, those distributions are never taxable. You never pay tax. So all that growth, if it's going out, like it's, it, maybe you have your favorite, you know, uh, pet shelter, whatever. And you have your, and you, you know what? I'm going to give five percent a year to that pet shelter. That's the textbook uh, private foundation where all you're doing is managing the money, growing it, growing it, growing it, and it's giving it to places. If that's you, or maybe it's your church, if that's you, these things are great tools because you could get a nice deduction going in, and then it grows and grows and grows, and then you can do your giving. Instead of coming out of your pocket, let it come out of your private foundation. It's not paying taxes. You get a lot more bang for your buck that way. And then number three, tax-free growth, 100%. There's, uh, if it gets too big, I forget. There's like Harvard, I think now has a, Congress had a massive, you know, massive charity tax. I think it's like a 1% or something like that. If you have too much uh, in your endowments. Uh, but for us mortals, there's no tax. Uh, so it ends up working out really, really, really great. Number five, this is what I call the triple threat. You ready? Health savings account. Because this will check each box. Boom, boom, boom. And it's really, really simple. A health savings account allows you to put, it's between about $4,000 and $8,000 a year tax deductible into a plan as long as you use the money for health expenses zero percent tax none zero you get a deduction going in you pay nothing coming out there's nothing quite like it on this list i get a deduction it's, it's limited. It depends on whether it's family or single. I have to have a high deductible plan, which most of us do. And boom, I can get a deduction. So I could put, let's say I put $5,000 a year into this thing and it grows and grows and grows. You know, it can, it can reimburse you for all of your medical expenses you incur, even if it's from previous years, so long as the plan existed. So once you establish this plan, an HSA, which you do it anywhere, just go to Fidelity, that's what I did, or you go to Schwab or any of them, they all have HSAs. I set up an HSA, I put 5,000 bucks in, I get a $5,000 deduction, so I save on taxes. And it grows and grows and grows and grows. In the meantime, I have co-pays, deductibles, things that aren't covered for health and stuff, and I start to keep track of it, and that gets to be big. Eventually, the HSA, let's say, again, I put $5,000 in that, that, that 5,000 turns into 10,000, let's say in seven years. I could pay the entire $10,000 out to myself and cover all the expenses I had during those seven years. Guess how much tax I pay? Zero. Zero. I got a deduction and I didn't have to pay tax when it comes out. That's why they call it the triple threat. And the growth, 100% tax-free. So let's say that I open one of these up. I'll just use me as an example. So I did one at, at, at Fidelity. What do I do with it? I, I do covered calls. I just, you know, just do basic stuff inside of it. I buy stocks that uh, are income producers. So I love my dividend kings and things like that. And they're always paying out dividends. I got a deduction when I put the money in. And those accounts are just getting bigger and bigger. All I have to do eventually is use that money uh, to cover my health expenses and I never pay tax. If you can't and you say, oh shoot, then it is possible after a certain age to, to, to roll it into a Roth, believe it or not. It can actually, I think it's 64, 65. If it gets too big and it's sitting there and you're like, oh shoot, I don't have enough medical expenses, which was said by nobody ever, right? Like no, nobody says that. Um, but if you were in that situation, there is the possibility to convert it over into a Roth. So these are, again, super effective tools. So there's a triple threat on that screen. So those are my top five guys, real estate, oil and gas, traditional retirement plans, charities, donor advised funds, your 501c3s and 
HSAs. And those are the top five. Hope you got something out of it. Share this with folks if you think that they would benefit from it. And uh, let me know your favorite strategy of the top five down below in the comments. And I'll see you later. Hey guys, if you'd like to learn about land trusts, LLCs, corporations, tax planning, even estate planning, we teach a live event every week called TAP, Tax and Asset Protection. All you have to do is type in TAP below in comments. We'll send you free information how you can get access and attend absolutely free.